Welcome to Damn Good Movie Memories with your host, Brian Davis. This podcast is the cure for your long commute and super boring work day. There's a place where deals are made and legends are born. And there was a kid they called Lightning Boy. He was searching for the lost song. You could be the first man to record it. For a piece of fame and fortune. Like Clapton did with Crossroads, the Rolling Stones did it with Love in Vain. And he was looking to get him there. Welcome to Bluesville, son. This is the real thing. This ain't no book. Lightning Boy and Blind Eye. What the hell are you guys supposed to be, huh? Both blues men. Hey, well, I'm the blues man. He's from Long Island. All I need is a Mississippi string tie. I'm ready to roll. Yeah, you need a lot more than that. You know, the owner walked up to Willie, gave him three $100 bills, and says, your boy can play. Only one blues man in town tonight. It was me. I'll choke you. There's a place where deals are made. And you made your deal at the crossroads. Yeah, I made the deal. Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're a real smart boy, ain't you? Where a thin line separates the good. I'm giving you all the magic I got from the great. Louis Brown sent me. Eugene Martone is ready to cross it. Hey there, it's Brian Davis, and for this week's episode, we're going to cover the movie Crossroads from 1986. The studio was Columbia Pictures. Release date was March 14, 1986, with a running time of 99 minutes. The rating was R. The budget, I couldn't find any totals for that, and the box office only took in $5.8 million, making it the 101st ranked movie of 1986. However, Roger Ebert at the time gave it 3.5 out of 4 stars. And here's his review. Crossroads borrows so freely and is a reminder of so many other movies that it's a little startling at the end to realize how effective the movie is and how original it manages to feel despite all of the plunderings. The movie stars Ralph Macchio as a bright teenager who studied classical guitar at Juilliard and worships his heroes, the great old blues musicians of the 1930s and 40s. One day he tracks down a survivor of that era, a harmonica player named Willie Brown, played by Joe Seneca. He finds him in a nursing home. Macchio helps him escape, and they hit the road, hoboing their way down south to a crossroads where Seneca once made a deal with the devil. With the devil? You bet. Crossroads is a cheerful cross between a slice of life and a supernatural fable. And at the end, it's up to the kid to pick up his guitar and outplay the devil's man to save Seneca's soul. The story is a combination of no less than two reliable genres. It borrows, obviously, from Macchio's movie The Karate Kid from 1984, which is also a story of a young man's apprenticeship with an older master. It also borrows from countless movies in which everything depends on who wins the big fight, match, game, or duel in the last scene. The notion of the showdown with the devil may have been suggested by the country song The Devil Went Down to Georgia. And yet the remarkable thing is how fresh all the material seems and how entertaining it is. Just when I am ready to despair of a movie coming up with a fresh plot, a movie like Crossroad comes along to remind me that acting, writing, and direction can redeem any plot and make any story new. The foundation for Crossroads is the relationship between the boy and the old man. And here we have two performances that are well suited to one another. Macho again, as in The Karate Kid, has an unstudied natural charm. A lot of young actors seem to take themselves seriously, but not many have Macho's gift of seeming to take other things seriously. We really believe in this movie that he is a fanatic about the blues and has read all of the books and listened to all of the records. Seneca does a terrific job as a rock-solid, conniving, no-nonsense old man who doesn't take this kid seriously at first and uses him as a way to get out of the nursing home and back down south to the crossroads, where he has a long-standing rendezvous. The kid knows that Willie was a partner of the legendary blues musician Robert Johnson, and he makes a deal with the old man. 
He'll help him return to those crossroads if the old man will teach him a lost Robert Johnson song. Jamie Gertz is a newcomer, and this is her second major movie this year, after a somewhat thankless role in Quicksilver with Kevin Bacon, in which she worked for a bicycle messenger service. She's just right for Crossroads, with the toughness required by the character, and yet with the tenderness and the romantic notes that remind us that this is really a myth. Another good performance in the movie is by Joe Morton, who played the brother from Another Planet, and this time he's the devil's assistant, sinister and ingratiating. The film was directed by Walter Hill, who specializes in myths, in movie characters who seem to represent something greater than themselves. Detailed character studies are not his strong point. He makes movies such as The Warriors, 48 Hours, and Streets of Fire, in which the characters seem to be made out of stuff of legends. In 48 Hours, though, he also found the human qualities in Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy's characters, and he does that again this time, making Seneca and Macchio so individual, so particular, that we aren't always thinking that this is a movie really about an old man and a boy and the devil. And a word about the music. Ry Cooter did most of the soundtrack, drawing from many blues sources, and the movie is wonderful to listen to, confident and sly and not all tricked up for Hollywood. The closing scene with the dual guitars presents a challenge that perhaps no film composer could quite solve. You know, what's the right approach to music as a weapon? But somehow, Cooter actually does pull off the final showdown. And that's the end of Ebert's very positive review on the film. What's funny is, I had never actually read Ebert's original view of Crossroads until prior to preparing this episode. And I'm sort of shocked how much he actually enjoyed the film. Then again, you know, I've read a lot of Ebert's reviews just doing this podcast. He may have just been burnt out with all the fluff and pop sheen from most of the movies coming out in the mid-80s, especially the soundtracks. Now, Crossroads, not to be confused with that atrocious Britney Spears farce in the early 2000s, uh, he had the perfect premise for me when I was a kid. You know, you had the Karate Kid playing blues music. I was in heaven since the Karate Kid was one of my favorite childhood movies. And I was basically raised on blues music for my father. Now, there are definitely issues I have with the film, but ultimately, any film promoting blues music is frankly a good thing, in my opinion. And one really interesting thing about the 80s is though musically, people only seem to remember the pop and the rap and the hair metal of the era, but really, blues music had a major resurgence in the 1980s. I truly think Stevie Ray Vaughan certainly helped with his flashy, Jimi Hendrix-like take on you know, blues guitar music when it took off in the early 80s. And if you're an 80s movie nut like I am, you'll remember how many blues songs were actually included in films in that decade. Okay, let's get into the main cast. Of course, you have Ralph Macchio, who plays Eugene Martone. Now, I covered Macho's early career in the Karate Kid episode. Between that enormous hit and Crossroads, Macho only appeared in two films, both from 1984. He was in Teachers with Nick Nolte and Joe Beth Williams, and he was in a TV movie called The Three Wishes of Billy Greer. I had never heard of the last one, and it's about a teenager who must cope with a disease that causes himself to age at an astronomical rate. Sounds interesting. You have Joe Seneca, who plays Willie Brown. Now, his career began in show business as a musician, not as an actor. He was part of an R&B group in the 40s and 50s called The Three Riffs. His film career began in the 1970s, and he appeared as a character actor in films like the original Taking of Pelham 123 with Walter Matthau, Kramer vs. Kramer, The Verdict with Paul Newman, The Evil That Men Do with Charles Bronson, and Silverado, along with a number of television movies. Jamie Gertz plays Francis. As Ebert mentioned, this was still fairly early in Gertz's career. She really only had small roles in films like Endless Love and Sixteen Candles and Mischief. Her big break, again, came also in 1986 with Kevin Bacon in the film Quicksilver. She did appear in a number of TV shows at the time in the early 80s like Square Pegs, where she played Muffy Tupperman with Sarah Jessica Parker, and also The Facts of Life, where she played another great character named Boots St. Clair. The director, Walter Hill. Now, I covered Hill's early career in the Warriors episode. From the Warriors to Crossroads, Hill directed The Long Riders, Southern Comfort, 48 Hours with Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte, Streets of Fire, and Brewster's Millions with Richard Pryor and John Candy. Okay, let's get into the making of the film. So normally, this part of the section they do for the podcast, it's about the specifics of the film, but Crossroads is different. I want to give an abbreviated history of Robert Johnson, who is really the catalyst for this film. 
I could do a multiple part series just on Robert Johnson's life and his importance to music as a whole, but I'll kind of give you the quick highlights just for this episode. You can go and watch many documentaries and read up on him online if you want further data about him. Now, Robert Johnson was basically a street performer and recorded only 29 songs in two separate recording sessions, both in Texas. One was in 1936 in San Antonio, and another session was in 1937 in Dallas. However, the 29 songs he recorded in these sessions are incredibly important, not just for the blues genre, but what eventually would evolve into rock music. Now, his first session in San Antonio was not a proper studio recording. It was done in a hotel room with very primitive equipment. Now, you think about it. Without the works of Robert Johnson, you may not have had the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, or Led Zeppelin, all of whom covered his tracks with great success almost 30 years after he first recorded them. You have songs like Crossroads and Sweet Home Chicago have been covered by countless artists. And just from the major acts, the Rolling Stones covered Love in Vain and Stop Breaking Down, Zeppelin covered Traveling Riverside Blues, and incorporated other Johnson tracks like Terraplane Blues into Trampled Underfoot. And like most legends, his work wasn't appreciated when he was alive, but many, many years after his death. Now, the songs alone should have made Johnson a legend, but that's not the way fame always works, and many people believe the folklore of Johnson's life which is that, of course, he sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads in Mississippi. Now, because little was known of Johnson during his short life and records weren't well kept in the 1920s and 30s, legend often became fact when documenting Johnson's life. Now, part of this legend grew when blues musician Son House first saw Johnson's guitar skills, and he saw that they were very poor. And then when Son House saw Robert Johnson play again, Johnson's playing a totally change, like he was a completely different performer, and almost like a master of his instrument. Now, historians said that the time period that House first saw Johnson play to his supposed mastery was almost two years. So this was two years after he first saw him. It wasn't like an overnight thing. So if he did sell his soul, you know, the devil was working pretty slow here. <laughs> also, mysterious with Johnson's life is how he died. He was only 27 when he died in 1938. Now, the official, quote-unquote, official theory is that he likely died of syphilis. Now, the common folklore is that Johnson was poisoned by tainted whiskey by a jealous husband after Robert Johnson had tried to pick up this guy's wife. Now, Johnson often would pick up different women in various towns he stopped to perform in and as a way to ensure that he had a place to stay when he was in town. So, the womanizer theory definitely has legs, but again, the poison theory is just that, a theory because no formal autopsy was ever performed on Robert Johnson when he died. Now, as for the film itself, Crossroads screenwriter John Fusco was a traveling blues musician in his early life, and he wrote the screenplay as an assignment when he was attending New York University Titch School of the Arts. All right, let's get into the film. So it begins with the sound of a single blues harmonica playing over the intro credits. We then see a black and white film of a man holding a guitar. Now, if you've never seen the film or are completely unaware about the legend of Robert Johnson, you won't understand this intro, and that's okay because it's all explained later. However, in this brief scene, it's supposed to be Robert Johnson standing at the crossroads in Clarksdale, Mississippi, which is at the corner of Highway 61 and Highway 49. Now, the harmonica played in this film is mostly performed by blues legend Sonny Terry, who is famous with his duo with Brownie McGee, who was a guitar player. We then cut to the legendary recording session in which Robert Johnson recorded the bulk of his material. We are then transported to modern times where we see a young Juilliard student named Eugene, played by Ralph Macchio, who is listening to a cassette of Robert Johnson's recordings. It's a quick montage of Eugene researching as much as he can about Johnson's life and suspicious death. Stand by. Rolling. Oh, 
Eugene discovers that one of the men that knew and played with Robert Johnson, named Willie Brown, played by Joe Seneca, is supposedly a resident at a nursing home near his school. Willie is a blues harmonica player, and after Eugene's initial attempt to meet with Willie fails, he decides to take a job as a janitor at the hospital in order to try to meet Willie. Okay, what you want, Mr. Janitor, man? I ain't made no mess. Hey, Willie. That's my name. I heard you play at harp till I dropped by say hello. You new here, ain't you? This is my first day. Well, hello, Mr. Janitor, man. Now let me be. Well, look, I just wanted you to know if there's anything I can get for you, anything you want or anything else. Yeah, you can get gone. Sorry to bother you. I'll just uh, I'll stop back later, okay? Mr. Fulton. Mr. Who? You were Blind Dog Fulton from 1939 to 1968, weren't you? What you been drinking, Sterno? Your name's Willie Brown. I mean, Blind Dog Fulton was born Willie Brown. He used that name up until 1938. After his friend Robert Johnson was killed, he headed up to Chicago, changed it to Blind Dog Fulton. It's all in the books. I got six cousins named Willie Brown. Man working at grocery store down the street, his name Willie Brown. If I had a nickel for every Willie Brown in this world, I wouldn't be here now listening to your bullshit. You're not the Willie Brown Robert Johnson calls out for help to in Crossroad Blues? Shit, no. Robert Johnson. I mean, you play harmonica. That's the real Willie Brown's main instrument. It doesn't make sense. Where I come from, you don't blow no harp. You don't get no pussy. There's no way. You gotta be. It's... Even though Eugene is studying classical guitar, his true passion is the blues, though his instructors are less than impressed with his implementation of the blues with classical music. Narciso, please. That was very good, Eugene. Very good up to a point. Most people approach Mozart with respect. Evidently, that's an attitude you are not familiar with. I'm sorry, I didn't mean any disrespect. I was just making a joke. Now, all of the guitar parts that Ralph Macchio acts like he's performing in the film are played by guitarist Ray Cooter, as Ebert mentioned in his review. Now, Cooter's career began in the 1960s and most notably performed session work with the Rolling Stones on their Let It Bleed and Sticky Fingers albums, which are both renowned classics in rock music history. Now, throughout his career, he performed with countless other artists like Neil Young, The Monkees, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Randy Newman, Eric Clapton, the Doobie Brothers, Van Morrison, and the great blues legend John Lee Hooker. The reason Eugene is hell-bent on meeting with Willie is that he wants to find the supposed lost song that Robert Johnson wrote, but never recorded. Now, officially, there were 29 songs recorded by Robert Johnson in his two separate sessions in San Antonio and Dallas. Eugene believes Willie might have information about this alleged lost 30th song and potentially record the song himself as a tribute to his favorite blues artist. Now, Willie is equally annoyed and amused by Eugene, who considers himself a quote-unquote bluesman, which cracks Willie up seeing this enthusiastic young white kid from Long Island claiming he's a bluesman. Back at school, Eugene's professors tried to guide him to the classical path, but it's not what Eugene feels, regardless of where he was born. You came to us as a classical student. The word prodigy was actually used on occasion. And you have proven to be one of the finest guitarists in the school. Mr. Marton, a word of advice. Don't serve two masters. The discipline of the classical is very exacting. And if you persist in the other, you'll squander your talent. What if the other is my talent? 
Excellence in primitive music is cultural. You have to be born to it. Now, you are allowed to leave secondary school early to pursue classical studies. I suggest you re-examine your priorities. Now, though Willie claims not to be blind dog Fulton that Eugene believes he is, Eugene has physical evidence because he has a picture of Willie in his younger years and he's listed as blind dog Fulton and he gives Willie the picture. After what Eugene gives Willie the picture, Willie reflects on the day he decided to sell his soul for fame and talent as a blues musician. here, the famous Long Island blues man come back to pay another visit. How's it going, Willie? You ever been to Mississippi? Nope. You call yourself a blues man? You're not Blind Dog Fulton, right? Mm. Yeah, well, Willie, I got something here that you may be interested in. Blind boy, come over here. What's your name, Four Eyes? My name Willie Brown, sir. What you doing on these crossroads alone, Willie Brown? Robert Johnson told me I can make a deal here. A deal? <laughs> With who? Robert said man called Legba. You him? No, no, no. I'm his assistant. Let me see here. You got to tell me what's on your mind, Willie Brown. I got two dollars. <laughs> well, your green don't buy nothing down where leg but come from, boy. Now, you want to play like Robert Johnson? You want to play like Petey Wheatstraw? Well, say goodnight to your soul, son. Go on, blind boy. Sign. Here before 12 every Saturday night, and you learn them blues. Boy, about that two dollar? I'm running a little low on gas. See you in hell, blind boy. Now, the reason the devil's assistant, Joe Morton, calls him blind boy is simply because Willie wears glasses. The next day, Eugene tries to impress Willie with his guitar skills, but Willie has other things on his mind instead of some kid playing guitar. Oh, man. 
this shit. Here we go. A little soul from the golden ghetto. Hey, Long Island, let's hear the one about the plantation you was born on. Let's hear how you come to doing time on the pea farm. music talk, are you? Nope. Okay. Meet Blind Dog Fulton, the original one and only Willie Brown. You have found your man. Oh, this is great. This is great. I knew, I knew it. You thought... <laughs> Look, I'm not Robert Johnson. No, yet, you Willie, ain't. But I'm... You ain't even the beginning of a pimple on the late, great Robert Johnson's ass. You might have a little bit of lightning, but you're missing everything else. What? Like what? Mileage. You can't get that living home with your mama wiping your butt. No, I don't live at home. Where you live? It's like a school dormitory. Oh, school dormitory. Oh, times is hard. Times is hard. Will, wait up. Wait up. Look, hey, you know what song it was Robert Johnson didn't record that day? Of course I do. I was with Robert when he made it up. Memphis, summer 1936. Oh, could you let me in on it? No. Why not? Why should I? Well, you see, I can record it, you know, like Clapton did with Crossroads. I mean, the Rolling Stones did it with Love in Vain. I mean, it could be my whole introduction to the blues scene. We can record it together. It doesn't and make a difference. Just one more white boy ripping off our music. No, no. Willie, we'd be giving it to the whole world. See, there's all kinds of people that would give anything for that. I mean, me and you. We no, could just... you ain't deserving. No mileage. All right, Willie, look, when I get out of Juilliard, I'll put on some mileage. But right now, I just, I just. When you get out of Julie who? It's Juilliard. It's just a music school I go to. But one school stayed on down in the Delta. That's where it all started. Willie, here's something from the Delta. Tell me this isn't Sun House. Sounds like bird shit. All right, Willie, we could record the song right here in the hospital. Imagine what we could do with that track. Just imagine what... Eugene, get me out of here. What? Get me back down to Fulton's Point, my piece of land outside of Yazoo City. Right, escape from here. I Get wonder. me out of here, and you got that number thirty song. Are you serious? Are you serious? Wait, what are you trying to get me arrested? <laughs> Sounds like bird shit. <laughs> you know, Seneca is really perfect in this role. In any case, Willie has a surprise for Eugene. shit now. I'm serious about the song. The only shit to cut around here is you. Now, I've been of a mind that you was another lightning boy, but you just a chicken ass. Chicken ass, chicken shit. You can walk? I can still do a few other things, too. I may be about ready for another woman. You know, I've been married four times. I just wore them all out. You're not a cripple. I mean, you're always asking people to get things for you. You're not even a cripple. Yeah, well, they find out I can walk. They take away my Pontiac. Man ain't no man. Ain't got no car. You got a car? No. And you ain't no man yet. Not even close. Are you, Mr. Chicken Ass? Well, come on, Willie. I'm not chicken. I'm not crazy either. Even if I was, what do you want me to do? Get you to Mississippi on what they pay me here? I got some money I've been saving. You're not going to teach me the song? Sure I will, in the great state of Mississippi. I got a train to catch, Willie. I'll see you. Go home to your dormitory. Let them wipe and polish your ass real good, yeah? And be sure to call your mama and kiss her. Why don't you just leave my mother out of it, Willie? Look, that song, Robert Road, is a real good one. You could be the first man to record it. All right. Look, tomorrow morning, 5 o'clock, you be ready. We'll go to Mississippi, all right? You mean it? I told you, just be ready.
be out in a few minutes, okay? Show me the kid. So Eugene breaks Willie out of the hospital and they head to the bus station. Eugene only has enough cash to get them to Memphis before they change buses. Willie promises to pay for the ticket from Memphis to Mississippi and Eugene hesitantly agrees. It's all youthful ignorance on Eugene's part. On the bus ride to Memphis, Willie gives a bit of historic knowledge along with the reason he went to jail for killing his guitar player who was stealing money from him. Eugene doesn't really think that Willie sold his soul like Robert Johnson, but Willie is still haunted by the memories. So the pair arrive in Memphis, and Willie gives Eugene his money roll, which is a few pieces of paper padded under two twenties. That's right, he's only got 40 bucks to the horror of Eugene. They are 200 miles away from their destination, and 40 bucks won't even get them a third of the way. So Eugene is going to get his first lesson in the real blues. It's time to hobo, as Willie calls it, which is hitchhiking. They get a ride in the back of a pickup to Mississippi, but they still have a ways to go. About 40 more miles and we make it into Greenville. Great, Greenville, Mississippi is where I've always wanted to be. You don't know nothing. A lot of good blues men from around Greenville. A lot of fine fox and llamas too. Yes, sir. Greenville is famous for pussy. Hey, look at the train over there. Get that lost song if you can't make the train talk. Anyway, the way you plan is gonna take you ten years. Well, then maybe I'll just have to do what you did, Willie. I'll go down to the crossroads and I'll strike up a deal with the devil, and that'll take care of the whole thing. Don't you ever say that again. Eugene literally needed a good slap of reality from Willie, as Eugene doesn't know the first thing about the lore he's been reading about. You know, Willie's lived it. Willie also gives Eugene some tips about the gear he should be playing. You ain't drinking your beer now. Come on, we gotta get moving. Maybe I just wanna hang for a minute, all right? Look, there's a payphone outside. Go out there and call your mom. She'll be checking up on you by now. She's in Europe, Willie. Nobody's gonna notice I'm gone for a week. Nothing to send you business anyway. Kind of testy, ain't you? Oh, well, I got no reason to be right. You know, Willie, I came down here to learn Robert Johnson's lost song, not to get slapped in the face by an old man or find out I got to become king of the hobos and go broke. I'm sorry your life I... turned out so hard, Eugene, but I got my own business to tend to down here. And I don't mean for you to slow me down. Business? What business? Personal business. And given your attitude, you got no reason to know what. My attitude? What the hell's the matter with my attitude? I have a great attitude. You got your mind made up about how everything works, don't you? How are you ever going to learn anything new when you know everything already? Look at this old guitar you've been squeaking on. I bet you saw this thing in the music store and bought it just because you thought it was beat up. Well, you got it all wrong. Muddy Waters invented electricity. Yes, sir. Now, I can tell you're a real musical type young fella. Good looking boy, too. Know what you're talking about. Now, I got something right here, somewhere right here for you. They call this here a pig nose. Now, you just hook it on your belt, plug it right in there, and you amplify it. Wait, I can walk around with this amp on? Oh, sure thing. I mean, you'd be a walking concert. Let me check this out. You got that on? Yeah, go ahead. This is a great rig. It's great. I can go electric and portable. So you're right. It's like I'll be a walking concert. You ain't lacking in confidence. I'll give you that. Now, we cut off a couple of inches off of this tube in here and make you a slide. You want to play some Delta Blues, you got to use a slide. All right. Now, if you can come up with $400, you can take the whole rig. Mighty fine watch. Let's move on down here and let's talk through business. Mm -hmm. Look here. 
Let's see what we got here now. Look, this one is worth over eleven $1 hundred dollars. Your mama probably put a few hundred bits on it. You understand me? Hey, you? Willie, take a look at this hat. All I need is a Mississippi string tie. I'm ready to roll. Yeah, you need a lot more than that. <laughs> well, why you want me to do that? Well, I tell you. So while walking down the road, it starts to rain heavily, and they find it an abandoned house. But they also find out that the place isn't empty after all. Move your ass right back out that door, sucker. Come on, get the hell out of here. That's the way it's gonna be, huh? All right. Come on, missy. You won't be the first woman to ever cut me. Let me tell you, you won't be the first woman to ever whip my ass either. Okay, that's the way you want it. Come on, it's your funeral. Come on, keep going. Come on, come on. Go ahead. Are you gonna stand there? Or are you gonna call me up? Oh, shit! You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Pulling a knife on an old man half blind, then want to chase him back out in the rain. Back in my day, hobos respected each other. What name you go by? Francis. They call me Blind Dog Fulton, also known as Willie Brown. Also... What about him? Lightning Boy Martone, also known as Eugene. Lightning Boy and Blind Dog. What the hell are you guys supposed to be, huh? We're both bluesmen. You know, I'm the blues man. He's from Long Island. Well, Hobo, and what about you? I'm hitching from Philadelphia going out to L.A. I got a dancing gig out there. Yeah, well, this road ain't no place for a sweet pants like you. Now, you take that from the greatest hobo that ever lived. How old are you, anyway? You under 16? Yeah, you're right, Willie. I'd say she's definitely jail based. Oh, yeah? I don't see too many signs of puberty on you, honey. Anyway, I'm 17. How old are you? I'm 17. Oh. What, are you a runaway? Yeah. Four-time vet. I think I threw him a curve heading south. Yeah, well, they threw us a few curves, too, since lightning broke me out. You broke him out of jail? No. Look, it, no, it was like a nursing home. Oh, a nursing home? Oh, give me a break. Excuse me while I go put my pants on. Pack. Get your stuff together. Which way are you guys headed? Uh, uh, south, towards um, uh, Yazoo City, Vicksburg. Staying on 61? Damn right, that's the road home. Come on. What are you doing? Just wait a minute. I'll this? tell you about it later. Training, well, I got a longer hike. I'm going down to Jackson. I'll see you around. Yeah, sure. I hope you make it to L.A. Fast. Come on now, we can't let that get away. What are you talking away. about? She's bad news. That thing's got a leg on it now to get lots more rides in your thumb. Come on. Yeah, could you take me as far south as you can? Sure enough. Oh, great. Shit. Dude's taking us to the next town. From there, we're going our separate ways. Hey, no problem. We don't want you slowing us down anyway. So the guys meet with Francis, played by Jamie Gertz, and Willie knows that they can get more rides with an attractive female than on their own. 
So Willie and Eugene try to earn a bit of cash playing outside of a bar, which goes over pretty well until the racist owner of the bar makes it known that he doesn't like the guys taking away his business, nor is he fond of black people. Eugene is getting a dose of reality in the Deep South he never experienced in New York. In the meantime, Francis tries to earn some extra cash by partaking in the oldest profession in history. That's right, prostitution. However, the sheltered Eugene decides to try to bail her out, but gets more than he bargained for. What are you doing here? What are you, crazy? Come on, let's get you out of here. Come on. Francis, get your ass in here, or oh, I'm gonna get nasty now. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be right in. I'm coming right in, okay? Well, hurry up, darling. Henry's waiting. Shit. What? What? Francis. When he comes out of the shower, I want you to put his lights out. We'll grab his wall and we'll get the hell out of here. You crazy? You wanted to rescue me, didn't you? So when he comes out, knock him on his ass. God, she's more problems than she is working. How come you still got your clothes on? What the hell's going on here, bitch? Get him, Eugene! Get him, ah, son of a bitch! Get off of me! Get off! Get off! Get off! Back off! So these walls be getting a free paint job. <laughs> All right, now just hold on, don't you? Shoot. A little underdressed, Lloyd. You're right. Maybe you better put your coat on. Listen, why don't we all just quit here? Because, uh, things are getting uh, just, just a bit out of hand. You just have a seat on the bed there, mister. Where'd you get the gun? Same place you got your guitar at the pawn shop. A blues man never travels the road without a pistol, no, sir. His Walt and his keys are probably in his pants in the bathroom. You heard what the lady said, lightning boy. Wait, what, are we going to steal his car, too? That's right. Go get the wallet and the keys. Well, come on, let's just get out of here, man. What'd you expect out here, a picnic? Are you going to stand up and be somebody? You're going to call your mama on the telephone. Move! Shit. Listen, Lloyd, we're going to borrow that car of yours for about 24 hours, OK? If we get any heat before them, well, then I'm just going to have to tell a statutory story since I'm only 15. Yeah, we're gonna blow the whistle on your whole family meat market. That wouldn't be too good for your business, would it, Mr. Motel Man? Huh? I like the lady say, 24 hours. You find your car safe and sound in the parking lot of the bus station in Jacksonville, Florida. So they take the stolen car to an off-the-road junkyard to get some cash and then find an abandoned barn to stand. Guys like uh, Sunhouse, Charlie Patton, Robert Johnson, they were the best side players in the world. Total influence on rock and roll. Come on, Willie, we're gonna get you to this old bar and get some rest, all right? Don't worry, Lightning, I ain't gonna drop down dead on you tonight. See, Willie was one of the last guys to play with Robert Johnson before he died. Wait a minute, you think that Willie's gonna teach you this last song that you keep talking about and that's gonna make you famous? Right, I'm gonna learn the tune, you know, get it down to the note. Add a little of my own stuff, I'll make it special, but it's my ticket to the blues scene. Yeah, well, I hate to tell you this, Lightning Boy, but it all sounds like a crock of shit to me. Me too. Hey, you feeling okay, Willie? Let me be now, I'm tired. All right, well, look, if you need anything, just holler, okay? I say let me be now, I'm tired. with Willie. I don't know. He looks really tired. I mean, he's almost 80 years old. This trip's got to be wearing him down. Jesus, if something happens to him out here, man. Do you think we should get him to a doctor? Well, no, I can't. I mean, I can't. They'll find out who he is. They'll just ship him back to Harlem to die. I'm not going to let that happen. I promise I get him home. <sighs> Do you really think there is a home, Eugene? Well, what the hell is that supposed to mean? Well, look, how are we supposed to know he's this famous blues dude? You got any proof? Yeah, he told me. I trust him, that's all. Look, Eugene, I'm falling in love with the old guy, too. You know, he's a son of a bitch, but he's okay. But I know a con man when I see one, and I think Willie has made up this whole story to get at a gullible kid so he could stay out of rest homes and hospitals for the rest of his life. Are you full of shit? 
Oh, yeah? What are you gonna do if he kicks off here, huh? What are you gonna do? It could happen, you, you know. know. He is Willie Brown. He is the first acknowledged master of the country blues harmonica. The guy is a legend, you understand? He's just a runaway shit with a quick mouth. Why don't you just get off my case, all right? Go migrate someplace else. Do me a favor. Leave us alone. Don't worry, I'll be out of here in the morning. Look, I really didn't mean anything. I'm just, just a little rattled about everything. Okay, I'm sorry. I'd really like you to hang with us. I mean, I, I don't want you to take off. It's not like I don't like you. I really like you. nice. Really? Here's one of the big ones right here. Keep the 12 on him. Bring him on back. What you doing? What's going on? Hey, Willie, you right? What's... Oh, look like we got a couple of lovebirds up top. Hey, we wasn't doing nothing, officer. I'm a sick man. These children just tending to me. Keep him quiet, Chester. Look at here. Look at here. <laughs> Where? I hate to inform you good folks, but I got to be leaving you in the hands of Sheriff Tilford. So the trio is put in the back seat of a cop car, and Willie doesn't have much faith that this predicament that they're in is going to end well, especially with the life history of cops in the Deep South. However, the sheriff lets them go free, because as once they cross the bridge, they aren't in his jurisdiction, nor his problem any longer. However, the deputies take the majority of their money, and as Willie puts it, even though things have changed things still stay the same. And what he meant by that was even though the sheriff and his deputies are black, the corruption remains the same regardless of skin color. The three check into a hotel that night with what remaining funds they have left and head to a, some local blues clubs. But Eugene isn't digging the road of hard knocks that Willie is teaching him. Sir, Sunny Crub's place. Looks almost the same as it did 40 years ago. They used to charge a good 50 cents for a glass of whiskey. That was robbery. Did you know that place? Like yesterday. It's like a good place to pick up some bucks. Well, how are we gonna do that? That's my boy, green as always. I hope he wasn't too green up in that hayloft. If you want to be a blues man, you gotta be able to use your whip. He was an animal, Willie. You don't have to worry about him. All his parts are in working order. Well, well, big man, ain't you? Now you take this piece and go in there and bring home the big eagle. You go in there and have a drink and play a few songs. Now they're probably some rough boys, so you keep that iron handy. What you got to say for yourself, Long Island? I should be committed. That's what I have to say, Willie. I should be committed forever listening to you. My, my, my. 
What happened to Willie Brown, greatest hobo that ever lived, all-time great harp player? Wouldn't he just be able to walk in there and clean up? Sure thing. I've done it lots of times. You know, the problem is I'm starting to think that Robert Johnson's friend Willie Brown isn't within a thousand miles of here. And if he is, he's probably just out there buried in some unmarked grave. Is somebody saying they ain't believing what I've been speaking? That's right, Willie. I'm saying you're full of shit. You know something? Every time you mention Fulton's Point, nobody's even heard of the goddamn place. You know, I'm starting to think that you're just a con man who used me just to get your ass out of a nursing home. Where are you going? Look, you smart-ass kids, you don't need me. I do my business on this side of the road, and you white folks do your business on that side. That's the way they get things done in Mississippi. No matter where Eugene goes, he's out of his element, and he ends up in some shit-kicker country bar, which isn't looking for some kid to play the blues. Frances is doing her thing trying to rob old horny guys of their cash, and Willie is at a blues club trying to pick up on a woman. I don't, I don't know. Uh, whiskey, I guess. You look kind of young. Got any ID? No, sir. Not with me. I, I don't. Well, I reckon one snort ain't gonna hurt you. All the other boys I know know it's a place. Back into a jam to stay in the rain. Come on back, sweet daddy, and it's making all right. Hey, Gene, where you going? Oh, you are one pretty lady. You're not from around here, are you? Uh, no, I just got into town. I don't think we got anything against Lady Riley. Wanna dance? Yeah, I do. Well, let's do it. All right. That'll be a dollar, friend. Well, how about I play some songs on my guitar for the drink? I'll stand you that drink. Then you all ass out of here. Hey! Thank you. So bad, we're gonna pick all over this field. You know, I went down on that thing down my head last night. Frank, you got that shit right on the back because the cop needs He jumped up and started going out the window shouting, hmm. Oh shit, here come Blind Dog. I say, hey, I call out my 38 special CH. I say, hey, so blind, I can't see your naked ass going out by window. <laughs> Brown and blind off Fulton. You ain't supposed to believe nothing. Now, if you want to do something, here I am. <laughs> Maybe later, honey. <laughs> Let me through. Give me another beer and a vodka on the rocks for a pretty lady. Search me, I don't give a fuck. Well, I just believe I will. Okay, well, come on, why don't you get your hands off her, right? This your lady? Well, yeah, she's with me. Well, she snagged my wallet, and she don't want to give it back. Look, she said she didn't take your wallet. Did you take his wallet? No, I didn't his... take his right. wallet. And I'll tell you, you better shut his mouth before my friend here takes out his gun, huh? A gun? Whoa. Yeah. You got a gun? Yeah. Let me see. Go ahead, show it to him. Come on. Come on. Fella come comes on. in here. Packing a gun. Look, I don't want any trouble, all right? It's not hey! my gun. Holy shit, mister. Look, I don't want any trouble. Hand that piece over. Don't you dare. Hey, you will you just come on? Oh, look, great. I don't want to I don't want to get out of here, all right? Just get out of here. Now, now, hold it, hold it. Now, you can get out of here. I just want to give you a... Shut up! Now, hold it just a goddamn minute. There ain't gonna be no more fighting. Harley, Alvin, you settle down. 
Did you take his wallet, miss? Because if you did, give it back to him. Harley's dumb, huh? but that don't mean he deserves to have his wallet stolen. He's got a family and they need the money. You both got a lot of growing up to do. Now get on out of here. All right, now let's everybody get back to drinking. So after the country bar debacle, Eugene and Francis try their luck in the blues club, but aren't very welcome there either. But Willie bails them out. your guitar dressed to play in a black man's Jew. I'm surprised you can walk, boy. You got balls this big. <laughs> Let's take your guitar, bro. Yes, sir, people. The lightning boy has arrived. And if you be so kind to let him and his girl toward the stage, we gonna blow the roof off this joint. Let him to the stage, I say. I say, let him toward the stage. Now this boy's come a long way to show you how good he can play that thing. You wanna hear some music, people? Come on up here. That's the lightning boy. Yeah. With you. I told you not to come in here. I got some heat from the other side, Willie. I lost the gun, too. You dumb shit. We're gonna get heat from this side if we don't take them back home. Hey, call me Willie. Hey, call me Willie. Blind dog fortune. Smokehouse Brown. Call me Willie, the one and only Willie Brown. I'm built for comfort, not built for speed. Got everything you good girls need. See me coming, throw your man outdoors. May not get this way no more. Call me Willie, the one and only Willie Brown. Yeah. Until this point, seeing Ralph Macchio kind of faux playing guitar was a bit goofy, but it was fine for the purposes of the film. However, in this particular bar scene, it's just embarrassing as a music fan seeing him try to boogie on stage. <laughs> and the song is terrific, though, though it's best to listen without watching. I think Mr. Miyagi should have crane kicked his ass out of the club. <laughs> anyway, back at the hotel, Eugene continues to get a dose of reality from Willie. Willie Brown, Prince of the Delta Blues, blows into some old jook house has been dead for 40 years and turns the place inside out, man. And who is up there filling Robert Johnson's shoes, huh? 
Look like a dipshit from Long Island. Oh, come on, I was great, and you know it. You know, the owner walked up to Willie, gave him three $100 bills, and says, your boy can play. They know what they're talking about down here. You guys were terrific. You really You guys, us guys, don't count yourself out. Looks like Weevil's right outside of Vicksburg, which is about 30 miles shy of Yazoo County. You're almost there. Yeah, you know, Willie says that's the most beautiful piece of land in the state. I think when we get there, we should hang with Willie. I think we should settle into Fulton's Point until he teaches me a lost song, right? Then then we'll get a van, we'll tour the country, Blind Dog, Lightning Boy, Peddling the Lost Blues. This stuff is happening. Blues yeah, are coming back. Yeah, it sounds back. great. It really does. What do I get to do, drive the van? Oh, we could get a blazer, man. We could go for... Hey, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the Prince of the Delta Blues, Willie Brown! Bright lights fry your brain. I guess that's why you forgot your hat. Willie, I just played my first battle house. I'm a blues man now. Blues man shit. Only one blues man in town tonight. That was me. Where you learn to play them pussy chords in music school? There's only one school, Willie. I played the chords I learned out here on the road, and I kicked ass, and people felt it, so don't give me any of that garbage. People felt whiskey the same as I'm feeling right now and just about to feel some more. Hey, Willie, lay off him, okay? He was great. You got a problem with that, huh? Look, he's on the road to learn something. Now, he can't be learning nothing if he's thinking he's the boss you of the You won't give blues. an inch, will you, Willie? You, you can't even come in here after what happened tonight and say, nice job, kid. You can't even give me simple congratulations. You know what you want, Lightning. You want me to stand here and say, boy, you as good as Robert Johnson, but you ain't. Now, if you spend as much time with your hands on them strings as you do on this girl's ass, you might get somewhere. Excuse me, I think I'll go to my room and leave you two lovebirds be. It's a mean, shitty old man. Now, what Eugene doesn't realize is that Willie is tormented by his own demons, because he did sell his soul to the devil, after all. And that night, Willie continues to have nightmares about the deal he made over 50 years prior. That morning, Willie wakes up early and runs into Francis. Shame on you, Willie Brown, traveling all the way back down home as if you had a chance. Ain't got no chance, blind dog. Your soul, your soul, you going down, all the way down. Hellhounds on your trail, boy. Hellhounds on your trail. The boy, now you know. No, I... there's no goodbyes on the road. It doesn't work that way. You give Lightning Boy a hug for me, okay? Tell him I'll miss him. Nah, you're right. Ain't no goodbyes on the road. See you around, huh? What's this? Hundred dollar take care of you for a while. Keep you out of trouble. Get you to LA safe. I don't want you having to deal with no more of them motel men, you understand? Jesus, I can't believe you. Go ahead, take care of yourself. I miss you, Willie. Eugene wakes up to find Francis gone and gets another lesson about the blues. When your woman done left you, you write about it. And you can write about it when your good friend lies to you. Look, Willie, I know I'm not supposed to feel sorry for myself. And I know that you've been through things that are a million times tougher than my life's been, but I'm going to miss her. I'm really going to miss her. A man with a whole lot of sense said, Blues ain't nothing but a good man feeling bad thinking about the woman he once was with. You gonna teach me the song? Ain't no song. I'm sorry, Eugene, I lied to you. I just wanted to get out of that place so bad. Robert gave us 29 songs. It was enough. Never was a number 30, not that I knew of. 
You got to do it for yourself. That's what Robert would have told you. say macho looks more authentic for lack of a better word when he's sitting down playing alone or in front of willie rather than being on stage so after stopping at an old boarding house where willie once played music in his younger years he gets a ride to the crossroads and meets with an old friend start playing a piece. Why? Of course, there's a fella I've got to see. And if you play in it right, he's going to come around. Yeah, right, Willie. Who is this guy? Don't ask me who you know damn well who. Let's go down to the crossroads, Willie. We ain't here for you, we here for me. about Legba. <laughs> Legba? Where you been at, Slick? He done changed his name to Scratch. I don't want none of your mm. sense. I got business with the man. Me, no bastard, ain't you? Forget it, honey. He's crazy. Now, y'all sure you don't need a ride? Ain't riding with the likes of you, smart ass. Or your bitch, neither. <laughs> Suit yourself, old man. <laughs> You looking for me, Willie Brown? Been a long time, hasn't it, Willie? Yes, 
Yes, it has. Wait, what's going on here? Yes, sir, been a long time. You were about 17 last time we saw each other. One night on this old crossroads, wasn't it? What can I do for you, Willie Brown? I come to see you, tell you the deal's off. Oh, no. According to this here piece of paper, the deal's still on. You can tear that up and give me some peace. Why on earth would I want to do that? Now, you sloughed up on your end of things. I didn't end up where I wanted. I didn't end up with nothing. Didn't get nothing. You got what you were supposed to get, Blues Man. Ain't nothing ever as good as we want it to be. But that ain't no reason to break a deal. Of course, you had something to offer me. I got a couple of hundred dollars. They ain't interested in your money. You know that. How about cutting heads? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're a real smart boy, ain't you? Well, smart boy, I got a big white fella from Memphis made a deal with me a few years back. Real good guitar player, name of Jack Butler. Cuts heads every Saturday night, yes, sir. He discourages a lot of up-and-coming boys. Yeah, but Willie doesn't even play guitar. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. Ain't that too bad? Guess there ain't much hope at all for Willie Brown. Unless you might want to sit in for him. Don't do it. Sure, he's my friend. I don't believe in any of this shit anyway. I say don't do it, Lightning. You win? I tear up Willie's contract. But what happens if my man Jack Butler win? You get me. I already got you. Well, then you got me, too. Shut up, you here. I don't want you making no deals. Take it easy, Willie. I'm just calling his bluff here. We'll get to Fulton's point after this. Where and when for this thing? Oh, I can get us there real quick. Jack Butler's gonna like you. All right, normally it's time to stop here and tell you to watch the movie. And I'm going to definitely tell you to watch the movie, but how can I not mention, and of course play, the guitar battle between the Karate Kid and guitar virtuoso Steve Vai. Now, as a kid, I was nine years old when I saw this. I didn't know who Steve Vai was. It would be a few years later before I realized how incredibly ridiculous that a guitar virtuoso like Vai, who played with Frank Zappa and was in David Lee Ross' band, would be in a guitar battle with Ralph Macchio. In any case... Here's the guitar battle in all its absurd glory.
I think Steve Vai should have won an award for acting like he couldn't play the classical guitar part. <laughs> as nuts as that scene was, again, one of the great things about the movie that I still appreciate to this day is that a big film studio made a movie about blues music and an art form that deserves and needs to be preserved for future generations. So while the film definitely has its faults to music purists like myself, the film's tribute to the blues legends of the past is not one of their faults. All right, some fun facts. Keith Richards was originally considered for the role of Jack Butler. The real Willie Brown was a guitar player, not a harmonica player. The guitar duel, which originally was 15 minutes long, it was edited for the last two minutes or so to heighten the impact of the scene. Ry Cooter spent a year working on the soundtrack, so the filmmaker shot a sad and happy endings that were both tested with the audiences. And the happy ending was chosen. You're still going to have to see that one. The unhappy ending had Willie Brown dying. All right, we have a special guest who also has his own music podcast, and that would be Grown Up Rock, Stephen Michael, who has joined me multiple times on Damn Good Movie Memory. He's going to join me again to talk about Crossroads. And I will be back next week to talk about yet another random movie from my DVD collection. All right, we are back. It was Stephen Michael from the Grown Up Rock podcast. And this is a perfect movie for Stephen because it, it's music heavy, uh, but it's also got some unintentional comedy because, of course, the Karate Kid is playing guitar. So <laughs> welcome back, Stephen. Brian, I would like to be referred to as Blind Dog Michaels for <laughs> this episode. Is that possible? Hey, whatever you want to be called is good for me. Blind Dog Michaels it is. All right, shoot. Let's talk about a little crossroads. All right. So one, let me get into this. Uh, I, I probably already mentioned it on the earlier parts, because if you listen to Damn Good Movie Memories, you know I get into the whole history and I talk about the movie and then we we have our, our great interviews. I'm a huge, huge blues fan, you know, stuff from, you know, the 50s with Muddy Waters and, um, of course, B.B. King and Howlin' Wolf. And so this movie totally resonated with me back then because my dad's a huge blues fan. And so to, to watch this is perfect. Plus, I love the Karate Kid, so I couldn't go wrong. Are you a fan of the blues? And um, did you was this movie interesting because of that? Or was it because, you know, Ralph Macchio was such a, you know, kind of a, a big star at this point? I like blues in doses, uh, mm -hmm. just straight up blues. That's different than uh, I don't treat it as, uh, you know, rock, uh, blues rock, not like sure. an ACDC or whatever, right? Right. So I like blues in doses, um, but I do appreciate it, yes. So had you heard about the legend of Robert Johnson before seeing this movie? I had not. No, I didn't know anything about the Robert Johnson. I didn't know anything about uh, the legend. None of that stuff when I saw this movie. Well, I think that's what always resonated with with me. And eventually why I got into harder rock is you, you think about the early blues. They were basically singing about stuff that became mainstream for rock vocalists, whether it be uh, singing about the devil, singing about uh, women and uh, getting into trouble and just, you know, and the pain and everything like that. And so I think, uh, of course, the foundation of, of everything comes from the blues. And yeah, so like did that once you discovered that, were you like more intrigued to go maybe discover more, um, you know, straight up blues artists? Yeah, but to be honest, I don't know. I'm not sure when I would have even discovered the whole Robert Johnson myth thing that came much later. Like, I'm not sure that it even resonated with me when I saw the movie. I just kind of wrote it off as, 
uh, fictional movie stuff at the time because this movie came out in what, 86? 86, yep. Yeah, so I mean, I wasn't that old. I was like, you know, 18, 19 years old, whatever. So it was just more about music and entertainment than anything to me. And I never went beyond that. I think I discovered the uh, whole Robert Johnson thing much later in life when I got old and I got into some of this uh, mythology and some of the urban legends and stuff like that. And in fact, um, Netflix recently, like a couple of year, maybe a year ago, re-released this um, Robert Johnson documentary thing, which mm-hmm. I found pretty interesting, you know? Yeah, because there's not a lot of information about them, because, about him, because it was in the, the 1930s. And, um, you know, what was interesting about the 80s is there was almost this huge blues revival. And I think a lot of it had to do with like Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, the popularity of him. But then you would see like, you know, a movie like Adventures in Babysitting and you'd see this great uh, blues musician Albert Collins playing in a band and he's part of the movie. And, um, you know, you would see a movie like Roadhouse and you have like the Jeff Haley band. So I think it was really cool that the blues kind of had a revival uh, in the 80s, because Robert Johnson was basically forgotten because he only recorded 29 songs, uh, you know, in the in the 30s. But in the 60s, once the British, you know, uh, blues invasion kind of happened with, you know, Cream and obviously the Stones and bands like that, then he started to kind of get recognized. And then people started to dig in. Well, who is this Robert Johnson? Because all these songs are being covered. I mean, Zeppelin definitely covered a lot of his stuff. And, and the song Crossroads was very popular. Well, yeah, you have a lot of uh, modern musicians, guitar players from Clapton on down paying homage to the blues and stuff like that. But uh, this is music uh, that, you know, this is where Led Zeppelin and bands like that came from. And so, you know, it's it, it was an important part of music history, especially where rock and roll is concerned. And uh, I go back and just you know, discover a lot of that information, that documentary really opened my eyes to blues as a whole and Robert Johnson as a whole. So I found it pretty interesting, you know, definitely. And I think the, the I think the greatest part about this, even though I don't find this to be a, a great, great movie, is that it did it probably introduce a whole new generation of people to the blues, which I think mission accomplished that way. Um, but let's let's get into Ralph Macho. Would you have picked someone else to play this role? Looking back on it, I think it's easy to uh, armchair quarterback it and say, yeah, there Mm -hmm. definitely needs to be somebody else in this role. At the time when this is casted, he's coming off of his success with Karate Kid. Uh, I think that it probably made sense to people at the time. They needed somebody to sell it. Watching this movie, though, I think this is a movie – because I watched it this morning. I think this is yep. a movie that would greatly benefit from a redo in 2021 and just maybe make it a bit grittier mm-hmm. and dirty up the characters of Ralph Macchio and even Jamie Gertz and make it just a little bit dirtier, nastier. I even watch this movie. This is this is what's stupid. I watch these movies. <laughs> yeah, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I watch these movies now and have different thoughts like uh, because of some of the things that Hollywood does, I could see Hollywood taking the Jack Butler character. Mm-hmm. Which is and, Steve I. Which is Steve I and doing like a diaries of Jack Butler and doing mm. like these individual stories because – Looking, watching that movie now, don't you ever wonder about Jack Butler's story? Absolutely, because uh, the the premise, of course, being that Jack Butler obviously is is the devil's guitar player. He made the same deal as Willie Brown. Yeah, you know, I read that, but they never really talk about that. It's not sort at all. Of a, it's sort of a assumed, maybe. But I, yeah, you know what they say about assuming shit. <laughs> That's so right. <laughs> I would. I would say, what's his story? Let's get into his story. And where does he go after he loses the guitar battle? That's where right. does where does Jack Butler end up? Does he end up burning in eternity or does he become a tool for the devil? Uh, it's just they could do 
a lot of cool stuff with that if they would just think outside the box a bit. Definitely. And yeah, that's where, yeah, the ending, not to give it away, but there is, it's, it's very, there's a lot of an, unanswered questions and I don't know if that was done on purpose or if they actually thought this would be a sequel, but I don't, I don't think they would have thought that this would have been a, a franchise type of deal. Well, it's interesting. Uh, what I love about doing these uh, podcasts <laughs> with you, Brian, is it forces me to go do a bunch of investigation and reading and stuff like that, which yep. everybody that knows me knows I hate reading. <laughs> you read not it true up. at all. Not <laughs> not true at all. You were just recommending uh, uh, you know autobiographies to to read. So <laughs> Stephen's, Stephen's playing it up here. You read at a third grade level. See how that treats you, Bister. <laughs> Takes you forever to read a book. No, anyway. <laughs> You should sell your soul to the to Mark Twain or something like that. How about that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I read that they had recorded two actual different endings for this movie, which I had no clue about. You probably mm -hmm. said all that at the front. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the good version and the bad version. I actually think the bad version might have been more fitting for the movie, regardless of whether people wanted it or not. But then I guess it would have you know, sold, sold even less. Who knows? I don't know. Well, uh, I how. never, I never give away the, usually the ending. So go ahead and, and do it. We'll, we'll say there's spoilers here, but what, um, what were, what was that, that bad ending? So the bad ending was the Joe Seneca character, which is blind old Fulton dies in the end. I think it would have been that that's the bad ending, which is not what the movie ended up using. They ended up right. using the good, good version, the happy version so sure. to speak. But the bad version was they had blind old Fulton die at the end. They don't say how they had him die. They just say he died. And the way the movie was playing out, I mean, he was 80 something. He was having health problems as it was. Right. So it would have been fitting to have him after all this, just pass away, you know, just maybe go to wake him up at the end uh, in his chair and he's, he's passed away. He's 80 years old. It's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's particularly a bad thing. Instead, they kind of have this, uh, you know, it's, it leaves a lot to be desired ending, which I think was even worse mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't put a capper on the whole thing. And, you know, you talk about us giving away the end of the movie. If we're giving away the end of a movie from a movie made in 86, get off your asses. People go watch these things. You're killing me. That's right. That's what the <laughs> pandemic should have been for. Don't, don't worry about new movies that are not coming out. Try to find the ones you missed. Um, yeah, I think there could be like, did, did uh, Blind Dog end up recording a song with, uh, with uh, Eugene? You know, that could have been interesting. Yeah, and what I'm most interested in is whether or not uh, Eugene, a lightning boy, right. ends up in a band with Ingve Malmsteen, <laughs> and they, you know, they go on to uh, take L.A. by storm, you know, right. because that's <laughs> that's what I'm most interested in. Ingve wants to get back to his roots, like uh, Poison doing Poor Boy Blues, you know. Exactly. I mean, you saw they. They completely ripped off Ingve in this uh, guitar battle, you know, right. <laughs> who, by the way, ripped off Pacanini, but we won't go there. Well, the funny part about this, and so I thought the real interesting part was making Eugene a classical uh, guitarist. And I thought that was great um, because you're adding, you know, all these little, uh, you know, uh, genres in, into into music. But the fact that Steve I wouldn't know how to play that, I mean, that, that, was, that was kind of the, the, the ridiculousness of all this. You know, he's considered one of the greatest guitar players of all time. Yeah, because at this point in time, um, Steve Vai would have already been replacing Ingve in yeah. Alcatraz. So he yeah. had to be able to play all those classical parts. Not that he couldn't play them beforehand anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve Vai, <laughs> good Lord. And he's in David Lee Ross band. Uh, at this time, was he in Dave's band? I believe so. I, I, very early on, probably. Uh, well, 86, and they probably recorded the movie in 85. So actually, yeah, it would have been right at the height of that. Right. So when this released, he probably may have been on, you know, on tour for the Eat em and Smile. Yeah, I think they were on tour in 85 with the Eat em and Smile. So they may have moved on to Skyscraper by this mm -hmm. uh, release. But sure, yeah. How did you feel about the Jamie Gertz character? 
Um, I thought she was okay. You know, look, I, there was a little bit, a little place in my heart for Jamie Gertz and a lot of stuff. And, uh, it's interesting cause I just recently watched, uh, less than zero for Ooh, some reason. That's I a brutal movie. <laughs> I hadn't seen it in so long and I wanted to watch it. And my wife absolutely hated me for making her watch that movie because <laughs> she's never seen it. Oh. Uh, but and don't yeah. read, tell, don't read the book. If, if <laughs> don't read that book for her, it's even yeah. worse. Yeah, it's a little rough for yeah. sure. But uh, anyway, getting back to it, I, I thought Jamie Gertz was okay, but I'll stand by my original uh, thought process, which is I would love to see this movie redone today in a much mm-hmm. grit, grittier situation because I think they could take these characters in different places. And if they had the right casting, I think it would really work. But um, there's just a lot of things to do that you could do with this movie. Absolutely. And uh, they could uh, they could actually get a real musician um, to be in this, you know, whether it be like a Kenny Wayne Shepherd or even um, there's a great uh, young blues guitarist out of Mississippi named Chris Stone Ingram. And he goes by the name of Kingfish, you know, maybe, in, you know, introduce him into uh, and into that sort of thing. I yeah, I think it's ripe for a for a repeat or a, a remake. Yeah, I I think you need a good actor, but uh as as you know when we reviewed and talked about rockstar recently one of the things that yeah. makes that movie is having actual musicians in that movie yes now i will say this i watched uh crossroads this morning with open eyes kind of just watching ralph macchio and i will say that uh uh, a guy named Arlen Roth, who used to write for Guitar Player Magazine, was credited as his uh, mentor and teacher. Mm-hmm. And Ralph Macchio did a pretty good job with the fingerings and made it look pretty good like mm-hmm. he was playing. So I will give him credit for that. I'm sure he can't play like that, mm-hmm. but... You know, I know I know just enough about guitar playing to be dangerous, and so I, you know, <laughs> watched watched his fingers and his picking on the fretboard, and and said, you know, this this looks pretty convincing now. So I I got to give at least that much credit, right? Sure, and I think that's where um you know with the, I I bring up the Star Is Born because that's been one of my favorite movies the last few years. Uh, they really that's where Bradley Cooper did a really good job about his fingering and his placement, and he definitely wasn't playing. It was Willie Nelson's son that was uh, uh playing Lucas Nelson, um and so I think that's yeah that's where they could go. I mean you could ha- you just have to have a, an actor that would really you know go that extra effort to make sure it doesn't look you know fraudulent. And of course, Ry Cooter was the one that was playing. Ralph Macchio's parts. Yeah, amazing guitar player. Rock Cooter's badass. Yeah, and I think, I, for me, the best part about this movie was always Joe Seneca playing Willie Brown. I thought there was an auth- authenticity there, and he just he's just a great actor. Like, it just, it was, it was a, he was just a, a well-done character. Hands down, I will second that as well. That is the one thing that I took away from watching that flick this morning, is that this guy did an awesome job, yeah. Yeah. So w- w- you just recently watched it. Um, would you recommend this or would you is this more like kind of out of curiosity? Like, hey, I liked 80s movies. I like the Karate Kid. Might as well watch it. It's not the worst movie in the world. <laughs> and hey, you might even dig some some of the music. Oh, I would without a doubt recommend this movie. I mean, if it's uh, it wasn't an entertaining movie, it was a little bit slow in places. Uh, and I think they could do a much better version today with uh, readapting the script and they could take this movie to all kinds of places and all that stuff. But I would highly recommend people go check out this movie, especially if you're a music music fan. There would yeah. be no reason uh, not to tell you to watch it. I wouldn't watch it if you're just a fan of the karate kid or some of that or Cobra <laughs> Kai or yeah. yeah, Cobra Kai or the outsiders, any of that stuff. Yeah. I wouldn't tell you just to watch it because you're a fan of that stuff. But right. uh, the other thing I read this morning, which I never thought about to be honest, and nobody's ever mentioned it before is, is the similarities between this movie and the karate kid. I, did you did you ever did you see that from the get go or was that something that uh, when you were doing the research, something somebody mentioned that? No, I, you know, it, it, it makes sense. It's an underdog story. It's a kid that you wouldn't expect to actually, you know, succeed in this type of 
in that type of lifestyle. But I guess it all comes back to to Rocky anyway. Like the, almost all underdog stories, oh, like uh, you know, have to pay homage to Rocky in some some form. Like it has to follow that sort of story arc. So so it always has to be like a young underdog with an old mentor, right? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's, I just never put those two things together, I guess, when I watched it. But when, when it was mentioned to me and I started thinking about it, I was like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and usually the, the young guy is always arrogant, which actually, that makes sense. When we're younger, we think we know it all and, and things like that. And, you know, it takes some adversity to get into it. So they just kind of, they, they tweak little things, you know, whether it be, uh, boxing or karate or, or the blues, it all, it all ends up, you know, kind of the same kind of story arc. But Ralph Macchio's character wasn't overly, um, like he wasn't boast, boisterous, you know, boisterous about his, his, uh, skills. I didn't think he was ever, I think he felt entitled almost like, because he, he was so into it that he didn't really pay his dues. If you're looking at the Willie Brown point of view, he's like, well, this this kid who went to college or he's in college and, you know, he, he's lived that kind of a cushy lifestyle, even though he probably really hasn't. And uh, but in Willie's eyes, he's like, oh, you didn't you didn't grow up like I did. And so he didn't really pay his dues. So I don't I don't find him arrogant, but I don't he also thought it would be easier than than what it was. I think Eugene felt. Well, I think definitely from Blind Dog's perspective, that was the case. But from Eugene's perspective, I didn't feel like he was ever um, he he came across to me as wanting to learn and wanting it bad, but not necessarily feeling entitled. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't feel that way. I thought that he, you know, he had a gift, obviously, because he is in Juilliard and yes. uh, touted as a uh, as a. Um, a genius, uh, and a prodigy, but he, it wasn't what he was interested in. What he was interested in was really the blues and, and the whole, uh, mythology of the blues that went along with it. And he just mm -hmm. wanted to learn and absorb everything that he could. That's, that's what I took away from it. Sure. And that brings up a great point about the blues. The blues has always been, they've always said it's, it's all about feel. Like it's not how many notes you can play and it's not something you can really necessarily learn. It's got to be in your soul. And mm -hmm. I think that's where Willie was coming from too. It's like to really get to be a true bluesman, you have to live it. You can't just, you know, go to school to learn the blues. That's, and it's like the school of hard knocks, you know, sort of. Yeah. A hundred percent. And the turning point was him. Uh, if you think about it in the movie, the turning point was when, Jamie Gertz walks out. Exactly. Who's a, who's a character that he was in love with, you know, in his mind. And now, now for the first time, he's feeling the pain that's associated with a lot of the blues, right? Exactly. And having nothing, like having no money, like that. Was, those were kind of funny scenes where, you know, Willie was supposedly kind of leading uh, Eugene on that he had, you know, a, a nice stash of money, which wasn't true at all. Yeah, to be fair, I feel that pain and and uh, that um, discontent for my partner, Sonny Pooney, every time <laughs> he makes me listen to something I don't like. <laughs> well, give me give me an example. What What is one thing that Sonny – let's get some inside dirt here. What is something that Sonny absolutely loves that you just can't stand? I don't know. I like to kid a lot, bust okay. balls, but truthfully, there's probably not a ton of stuff that Sonny makes me listen to that I don't like. Sonny, Sonny says a lot of the stuff I make him listen to is brutal, but he's just got cigarette butts in his ears most of the time. So <laughs> we can't believe anything Pooney says. Good point. Good point. But, <laughs> well, as always, Stephen, it's always been a pleasure and, and thank you for doing this. Hey, always a pleasure, and I always like talking musical movies even more with you, Brian. So thanks a lot for having me. Thank you, buddy. Come hang out and chill with Brian A. Davis and the Bad Beat. Wednesdays, 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on ThatMetalStation.com.